Well, that one was pretty hard to follow. <laughs> and I apologize, I'm also gonna be talking a little bit about Google because as Joe mentioned, Google was pretty ahead of this, but it looks like we've made a lot of progress since I left. So my name's Jen. Uh, I lead the research and design groups at Code for America. So when you're thinking about the future, you're probably thinking about the government, right? All the conversational interfaces that the government are doing is doing. So I'll tell you two stories today. The first one comes from Google. Um, working on Glass, I was leading the voice and maps and search interface there, and that was my first real experience working with voice design. And I was pretty naive at the time and really excited about building a computer that would kept you in the present, that you could talk to all the time. It could be like an elephant memory. So we created this whole corpus of what search would be like, and you could ask it any question, and it would return all these answers. It was totally amazing. Um, so one of the first things that I did as a very naive voice designer was I wanted to be really magical. So I was like, what if you could just say, how tall is Tom Cruise? And instantly it says, 5'7". And basically, I partnered with this researcher, and through all the research, um, nobody, none of the humans were ready to have that type of casual, quick conversation with a machine or a robot. They were like, what do you mean 5'7"? Like, what, it, what, is, what are you even answering? Like, I don't trust that you know what I'm talking about. So I was like, oh, okay, context. Uh, in the answer, so humans basically, even back in 2012 when we were doing this, humans can ask any kind of question they want. They can ask something like, how tall is he? Not even specifying the subject, but it's really the computer's job to give that context back to build the trust. So. Everyone liked the answers better when I specked out the TTS. Tom Cruise is five foot seven. So I was like, okay, we're starting to build a little bit of trust here. And even better was to use the visual. There he is. And when we were able to, we could even try to pull the query to show him looking not very tall. So like <laughs> matching, matching all of these things together was a way, way back when in 2012, to start to build a little bit of trust. In the dialogue, if you look at the anonymized queries, people are starting to feel more comfortable. They're building trust. But first, they needed that context. So a lot of the things, I'll just be giving little tips along the way. At least in 2012, but I think it's still true, right up front, don't be too magical. That magic that I felt, um, we also tried on bus stops. You know, people would say, when's the next bus coming? And if you said five minutes, they would lose their minds. They'd say, you, you don't even know what bus I'm talking about. <laughs> and through what Brendan was saying with the context, like we actually did know what bus you were talking about, but they didn't trust us at all. So we had to say, bus 47 is coming in five minutes. And then they're like, oh, you're amazing. You know, you know it all. And so that context, especially on the side of the chatbots, the voice engines, everything really builds the trust. And letting people be as flexible with that input, and then the output, having that be a little bit longer, show the context. And then over the course of time, you can start to build tighter turn taking, just like with regular people inside of a conversation. So that's a little bit about Google. Hey, the DMV. I bet this is a place where you've had a lot of great experiences. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the government services that we interact with and hate the most. Oh, yes, put the, put the microphone up to the mouth. That does help. Um, so thinking about Code for America. At Code for America, what we're doing is trying to bring in those expectations that people have around the way consumer technology can work, um, the ease of it, the immediacy and say, hey, there's nothing, there's nothing too special about this and there's no reason why government can't work that way too. So with a lot of our work and what, what we're thinking about, this one is less about voice and more about the conversational back and forth over text. Think about if you lost your job and government actually behaved this way through all the data trail that we leave. Basically, your local employment office knows, hey, you just lost your job and is there for you and is proactively going to apply for unemployment insurance. Think about your driver's license expiring. Instead of getting something in the mail, you know, in the way that government works, their back end is still mostly paper. So instead of getting everything in the mail, you get a text message that's like, hey, guess what? Your license is, in, is expiring in a month. Would you like to renew it? Yes. Uh, has your address changed? No. 
And that is it. Government can really work this way. So one of, the, one of the big projects that we worked on in California is redesigning the food stamps application. So in California, food stamps application before we were on the scene was like a 45 minute process, only available on desktop. And when you actually looked at the policy and the compliance, you only needed to ask people four questions to get that food stamp application going. And you could do it on the phone, which is the main computer that everyone's using anyway. So using this sort of user-centered, easy, simple, modern approach, you can really make services work much, much better. And so right now, the participation gap in California has narrowed significantly just by letting people use this application on their phone. Text messaging is even more helpful. In Louisiana, we started working with their State Department and looking at Medicaid. Nobody could figure out um, when to renew their benefits, what was happening. People would get this letter in the mail. The letter had all the information. There was no other way to get it. Uh, a lot of people getting Medicaid are stably or unstably housed. People weren't getting these letters. They'd show up after the date. It was terrible. So they're like, what can you do? So basically, simply by texting people, all of a sudden, you know, we, since we work with the state, we have to keep the data private. But the outcomes that you can get just by having texting back and forth between people around critical service really, really improves everyone in Louisiana's ability to get Medicaid. We had 300,000 people who we text messaged and the numbers went way up. Like it was something like 36% in the first week all of a sudden made it to their interview. And Medicaid will change their lives. And so some, something so simple as texting back and forth is really, really powerful. And I think, you know, it's a no, no brainer for us, but inside of these government offices, in the conversations we have, I think the epiphany still hasn't happened that they could do text messaging, that it's more simple than a letter campaign, and that all of their clients, um, it's easy to think that clients actually don't have smartphones, but most clients, even the, the most vulnerable clients will have some family member who has a device who can receive text messaging. That's their preferred method of contact. It feels friendly, they see it, and they do the action. And it's pretty easy. Uh, there's a lot of really good third-party tools out there. Sometimes we build our own text messaging applications. Sometimes we use Textit. And what you do, so this isn't as wonderful as what Google has, where you can develop these like really sophisticated back and forth. Like you can just structure out a basic flow of a form. And if you do it over text messaging, you're going to capture a whole group of people that were previously lost, previously stuck, previously unable to get benefits. And I think one nuance to call out between how you're designing for the consumer audience, so consumers like friendly, fun, back and forth, let's, not to make fun of Google, like, let's go to sushi. <laughs> and like, with this one, we had started out in California kind of friendly like that, like, hey, did you know your benefits are expiring? And inside Intercom, which is another conversational interface that we use, People were saying, like, like, is this a scam? Like, what do you mean? Like, what are you talking about? Like, why are you, I go into this office every single, you know, year, six months over and over, like, and nobody has ever talked to me this way. So for, for these types of conversations back and forth, you have to ramp up a little bit the, the formality, um, the introduction, the language. We did a study where we were looking at like, okay, can we push this a little bit more? And this shorter one on the bottom was my designer's favorite. She was like, okay, it's that much shorter and everything you learn in design, it's like pithy, make it easy. And that one performed the worst. People didn't even show up for their interview. There was a serious, statistically significant difference between the top and the bottom because it just felt less official. So there's something that you have to be careful with around context, where if, if what you're talking about, if the conversation feels critical, delicate, fragile, difficult, you almost have to skew a little bit more formal, at least in the beginning. Because every other experience that they're having with your service is not like this. This is not the experience you have when you walk into the office. This isn't the experience you have when you're on the desktop site. This is only the experience you have through our special little tech interventions. 
So there's a way that you kind of have to build that bridge. And we've had to pull back a little bit from the friendly happiness and try to, try to understand that, OK, we are building a different type of service, a different type of bridge, and we need to be slightly more official. So I think inside government, if you're in the way that you're thinking about consumer applications, so this kind of applies to enterprise applications as well. If, if like the main way you have to do something, like if your workflow is like 45 minutes long and then you know, there's 10 different steps and sometimes there's three different tools, like you're starting to see little glimmers that maybe a conversation would be easier, especially if you could describe it to somebody pretty quickly. So with the service landscape, because what people have had to do is go into these offices, take a long bus for two hours, spend four hours inside of Social Security, maybe you get what you're looking for, maybe you don't. Like That's a perfect place to use something like a texting interface where you can go back and forth, you can add documents from your phone. Like You're, you're just starting to see the nuances. Like It doesn't have to be that difficult. If I were gonna, going to describe to my husband all the steps I needed to do to sign up for Medicaid, like we could do that in a conversation pretty easily, as opposed to spending hours and hours, days and days, trying to get this done. So it just shows you there's an, op there's an opportunity there. And I think it's there for enterprise software as well. In sum, you can really, you can have better outcomes, especially if you're focused on the, on the grittiest problems, the most complex, when you're thinking, number two, when you're thinking about the input, as much as you can, have that be the wide funnel and really structure, so once again, in the government sector, structure that answer, make it feel like it's something that you can trust, give the context in there, but try to be as open, create as open of a door in the beginning of the conversation as possible. And then context matters. Um, I almost took out this word about emojis because we're a little on the fence in terms of what the data says. The data actually says that emojis are a little neutral, whereas if you add a first name, it's actually a lot better for people and the response rate's higher. But you're right on the edge with something like an emoji. And I think in California, you can get away with an emoji. It still feels like maybe it's a government service. But in Louisiana, it's not. Nobody's gonna respond. So you, you just have to be a little careful, especially when people feel like their livelihood depends on them getting those answers. So just a couple principles. Um, don't be too magical. Kind of try to follow the pace of the conversation to establish trust. The answers right now where we are with computers are, are the pieces of that puzzle that will build the trust between the person and whatever system they're using. Adapt your voice and tone, you know, kind of be careful of the friendliness depending on what space you're in. And I think the other thing is conversational doesn't have to mean automated. You can have a back and forth with someone, especially around something like a critical service like food stamps, where if you're not, if they're not getting the response they need, you can fall back to somebody on intercom or a client success person. You can fall back to a phone. Like there's a way that you can start with the coded back and forth and then have a person show up and say, hey, it seems like you're not really getting the answer that you need. Maybe you need a real person. And then you can code that data and make your system even better. Hot tip. Thank you.